So welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going to ask you all to mute, mute yourselves and just chat your questions and we'll ask Walter the questions at the end. And I'd like to introduce you to Walter Earl, who holds a BA in biology from Sonoma State University. He established and co-owned with Martha Graham, mostly native nurseries in Tamales. They sold the nursery and retired from the business lot, well, a little bit ago. And mostly natives now has moved to Point Ray Station. Walter and Margaret grew and sold natives and suitable non-natives to the general public as well as to lands the landscape trade for over 40 years. Their interest has been to grow drought tolerant, acclima acclimated plants suitable for the Northern California garden. Walter continues to grow plants from locally collected seed and also propagate from cuttings as well as divisions. Um, he has contributed his horticulture endeavors to the, as the nursery manager to the Santa Rosa Laguna Foundation. He is a master at native plants and native plant propagation. And we are very sorry that we can't be doing propagation in person today because Walter had been growing starts for us since last October. So I'd like to introduce you to Walter now. Hello, everybody. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. Wait a second. So I, one little update. Uh, I, I'm no longer employed with the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation. Uh, they they decided that they didn't have quite enough money for, to pay my salary. So they basically fired me. But the good part was was actually going to go in on the morning they fired me to quit, but they fired me instead. So that was probably an okay thing. Uh, so we grew, you know, lots of different native plants at the, and the difference between my job as a nursery manager and the nursery manager here was everything we grew at the Laguna Foundation was native. So we didn't grow any non-natives. Uh, next slide, please. Maybe go back one, yeah. There. So what what we what we ended up doing at the native at the Laguna Foundation was uh, we wanted to there there's something called and I call it the evil Phytophthora Phytophthora tenticulata, and um, it was originally found in a in a preserve over in um, uh, Contra Costa County that was being managed by the East Bay Municipal Utilities District and they had paid a nursery to grow a bunch of plants for them to restore it. Unfortunately, those plants that were planted on that preserve were infected <clears throat> with what I call the evil Phytophthora. And unfortunately, it wiped out a very rare manzanita population. Um, and so that's, we spent a lot of effort trying to mitigate that because we wanted to make sure that the plants we grew were not infected in any way. Can everybody hear me? Yes. So, so next slide, please. So the way we mitigated further is we had to sterilize our soil. And so we were actually able to purchase a, a diesel powered steam generator. And in the upper left corner of the picture, you can see this, the uh, contraption that the guy that's kneeling down holding something, uh, his name is Asa, he built all that and we hooked that to the steam generator. And you can see the steam coming out of the pipes. And so in this picture, we're actually unloading a, a load of potting soil out of my trailer. And then we basically cover you know, cover those pipes with that soil and make a long, like a windrow type pile. And the cool thing about doing all this is that you can, when you're, when the soil's all out of, out of whatever you haul the soil in with, you, you make the, the top of the pile flat and then you can pile all your used pots on top of that. And so you can sterilize your used pots at the same time you're sterilizing your soil. And a ton of research went into how you're um, into how to mitigate this for this horrible Phytophthora. But 
the nice thing is we, that the research showed that if you heat the soil to 180 degrees Fahrenheit and then stop heating it and hold it there for 45 minutes, you pretty much kill off all the evil pathogen. And, but you don't kill off all the beneficials that might still be in the soil. So that, that was kind of a neat thing. And then when, it, when the soil's all out and you have your pots on top, then you cover it with this plastic uh, tarp. And then we put these water bottles to hold the steam in. And anyway, next slide, please. So these are my native plant heroes. Uh, Theodore Payne, uh, he was actually born in England and came over to California in the early part of the 19, uh, 1900s. And he was probably the first pioneer of growing California native plants. And uh, he mostly spent his time down in the Los Angeles area. His, his organization still exists. He's, out, he's in the upper right there. Uh, his organization still exists. It's called the Theodore Payne Foundation. And uh, he basically grew native plants and then started selling them to other people who were then started using them in landscape. So he was probably the very first Californian native plant uh, gardener. Uh, Wayne Roderick is a real famous uh, native plant person. Uh, he got his start at the UC Botanic Garden, um, managing the native sections of the UC Botanic Garden and uh, basically built that whole garden from scratch. Uh, and he's a fellow with the Native Plant Society. And he, if you look him up online, there's tons of information with him. Uh, in the lower left is Gerda Eisenberg. Uh, she's, she started Yerba Buena Nursery back in 1960. And uh, she grew up on, she started the nursery on the ranch where she grew up, it's a cattle ranch. And um, I guess she decided that she didn't really want to have anything to do with cows. So she got rid of the cows and started growing plants instead. She started off growing ferns and then she decided to branch out and grow other things because there was a lot of native vegetation on the property. It was a fairly large ranch. And uh, so moving on, uh, uh, well, if you go back the, the, the previous picture, the, the two people on the lower right is Lester Roundtree and James Roof. James Roof was the original director of the UC Botanic Garden and he was actually Wayne's boss when Wayne was there. And they both moved over to the uh, UC, uh, to the Tilden Botanic Garden when they decided to build that garden in the, in, the, in, the, in the late, I think it was in the 40s, the late 40s. And so they, they both moved over there and spent a huge amount of time building that garden. And that's kind of a neat garden because they decided to design it based on California plant communities. And so when you go there, each plant community is distinct from another one, and that's how the garden was designed. And so James, James Roof, he's also a, a real, um, he's a real, another real famous guy. And uh, Lester Roundtree, she's an author who um, originally was from England. In fact, Theodore Payne was from England also. Uh, she was originally from England. They settled in the Midwest and tried farming, and they were complete failures and their family f basically fell on hard times. And she ended up in Carmel, California, where she uh, started a, a little seed business. And she decided that she was gonna learn native plants. She's a self-taught self botanist. And she would, um, she would, uh, she would start her, so basically where she, what, what she wanted to do is she, she her, one of her famous slogans was she wanted to visit plants in their homes. And so in the, in the early spring, she would get in her old beat up, I don't know what kind of car, I think it was an old Ford or something that she had removed the back seat from so she could camp in it. She would drive to the Southern California deserts and uh, uh, observe the, the desert plants and then she would make her way back north and then she'd finish up her excursion six months later in the Sierras and then come back to um, Carmel where she where, where she actually lived and so she was quite the adventurer and she went around lots of places so next slide please uh, so uh, Lester she was author of author of uh, uh, couple of books. The, the Hardy Californians is probably her most famous book. And she also wrote another book called The Shrubs of California. And the, 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 this is actually an original copy of her first book on the left. And in the, in the 
Oh, some time ago, I can't remember exactly when the copyright is, but uh, Judith Lowry from Larner Seeds received permission to update her book. And so Judith actually republished her book as, a, as an updated version. And she um, added more stories about Lester in, in that book. And that book is still available for people to purchase. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so uh, Wayne Roderick, uh, Wayne Roderick actually was born in Petaluma of all places. Uh, he grew up on his family's nursery off of Skillman Lane in northwestern part of uh, Petaluma, and he he would go all over the state collecting collecting plants. And one of my favorite stories about Wayne is that when we first started our nursery back in uh, 1984. This was probably about 86 or 87. Wayne would show up in his in his nursery, in his in his Wayne would show up and 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 visit our nursery. And uh, he'd come in and he'd he'd look like a park ranger. And so I would go find him and I'd say, Wayne, you're dressed like a park ranger. And he his story was, well, yeah, if you dress like a park ranger and you're out in parks collecting plants when you're not supposed to, they don't bother you. So uh, that's how he he. He cut some, he, you know, he, he wasn't a total legal guy, but he, uh, anyway, some of the plants he introduced, uh, the one on the upper left is Gary Elliptica, uh, uh, James Roof. Um, no, that's sorry, Gary Elliptica Evie. Um, I can't remember who, who he named that after. And then his other favorite thing was introducing plants named after his mother, who was Martha Roderick. And so the, the plant on the lower left, is in the middle left is a uh, hookra micrantha uh, Martha Roderick and I believe the story on that plant is he was driving through the redwoods up near um, Weot, California, which is up uh, up north of Garberville and he pulled off on he pulled off somewhere to probably you know relieve himself or something I don't know what but he pulled off and he saw this really nice little compact hooker growing with pink flowers and he liked it so much he took a few cuttings and brought them back and introduced it as hooker micrantha martha roderick and it is it's a really nice little compact plant with nice pink flowers he also introduced carpenteria californica elizabeth um, and i assume he got permission for that but because uh, he actually went down to the carpenteria preserve down near fresno up in the sierra and foothills and took some cuttings and then uh introduced that as Carpentry Elizabeth. And I believe Elizabeth is uh, named after Elizabeth McClintock, who was a, was a famous botanist at the Striving Arboretum for many years. So those are James's, some of James's introduction. A lot of these plants are still in existence in the uh, plant world. You, you can still find them in nurseries. Next slide, please. So there's basically different types of plant propagation. Uh, seed, you get more genetic diversity. Cutting, you clone, you're cloning mother stock. And for cuttings, you have softwood, semi-hardwood, and dormant. And divisions, I say similar to seed, but I, I'm probably gonna, actually it's more similar to cloning because when you do a division of something, you're basically cloning, cloning what, you, what you're dividing. So I don't know why I put that, but that's not ex absolutely correct. Next slide, please. So for cuttings, uh, there's a couple different couple different ways. And um, when we had our nursery going full blast, uh, we actually put in a fairly uh, complicated bottom heat hot water system where we had a we had a hot water heater with a solar pump that would move the water through those fine tubes. And it's I wouldn't recommend doing that because it was pretty complicated. The easier way to bottom heat is just buy an electric heating pad and a thermostat, and that way. Um, Bottom heat seems to be a little bit a little bit beneficial to rooting cuttings, especially cuttings that um, are are softwood or semi hardwood cuttings. Next slide, please. Uh, you can go to the next slide after this one. We're making a transition here. So there's basically two types of plant germination, uh, seed germination, epigeal, 
is uh, basically kind of like a bean plant. That, that would be epigeal and hypogeal is when, when the, those are tend to be woody seeded plants, things like oaks, buckeyes, uh, walnuts, things like that, where the seed actually germinates underground. And so it puts out a lot of root um, before it actually puts out shoot. So and the shoot come, shoot and root come out right at the, where, where the seed germinates. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit, you can't quite read it, but uh, seed, so this was a new slide I put in for this one. Uh, uh, so, so the, um, So you can soak seeds and um, anyway, stratify basically means you, you either warm or cold. So you mix them with some potting soil and put them in your refrigerator or you can also um, other things. Um, and one of the plants that you can germinate is a Matea poppy, which is notoriously hard to germinate. But um, if you soak the seed in liquid smoke, often you can get it to germinate that way. Next slide, please. So one of the projects I wanted to talk about from my former days at the Laguna Foundation was a project that we did last year, last spring, called, and we call it the Livy Project, which is Lamnanthes vinculans, Sebastopol meadow foam. It's an extremely rare plant, and I was working with my colleague, Sarah Gordon, and she had to jump through a zillion hoops in order to get a permit to be able to go out and collect seed from this plant out in the Laguna itself. And like I say, it's an extremely rare plant. And uh, so she actually did successfully get a permit and she went out and she collected a bunch of seeds and then brought them in. And one day I was at work and I forget what I was doing. I was probably planting acorns or something. And she came over and she had not a lot of seed, maybe two, 300 seeds at the most. And she, so she showed me the seed and she said, well, how do you think we should grow these? And I said, well, you know, they're, I said, they're annuals, right? And she said, yeah, they're annuals. And I said, well, if they're annuals, you just plant them. You don't, most annuals do not require any kind of treatment. And so what I did is I planted them in these plug trays. I had, a, I had an abundance of these plug trays. And so I actually planted them in these plug trays. And then we uh, grew them in the plug trays. And then on the lower left is, the, uh, is what we did is we took them out of the plugs and transplanted them to, into one gallon containers. And the whole point of the project wasn't to replant these plants back in the wild, but was to actually get them to flower. Hopefully they, they would be uh, pollinated by bees, which is what pollinates them in the wild. In fact, she actually brought a beehive in to help the pollination process. And so we, we transplanted them to all these one gallon containers and they were from two or three different sites. And so we tried to keep track of where they came from. And that's why that one, that one group of plants is, is, is looped off with that pink uh, tie. And we got, we got phenomenal German, we got phenomenal seed set. And I just, I just talked to my old boss the other day because I couldn't remember how many seeds. And so they collected all the seeds from the Lenanthes vinculans and uh, he talked to the person who kind of, uh, you know, was responsible for trying to figure out how many seeds we collected. So out of maybe a few hundred seeds, we ended up with 130,000 Lamnanthes vinculans seeds. And then those seeds were uh, actually then taken back out and replanted in the vernal pools. So they're, and apparently they're all germinating and growing and doing well. So that was a pretty exciting project. I, it's a project that I had never even considered doing, but, um, and it's a real nice little plant. Like I say, it's an extremely rare plant. You can't go out and pick it or anything, but uh, it's, a, it's a federally listed rare species. But she did go through all the, all the hoops to, to actually get a legitimate uh, collecting permit so we could collect it. Anyway, that was probably the most exciting project I did while I was at the Laguna Foundation. And, it, and like I said, we, we ended up with a phenomenal amount of seed like quarts and quarts of seed from not that many seeds to start with. Uh, next slide, please.
So this is just an example of how, how acorns germinate. Uh, so they're, they're hypogeal. So they basically, they send out a whole bunch of root before they send out any shoot at all. And the shoot comes out right at the very tip of the acorn, the pointy end, not the blunt end. And that's where the root's coming out. So right, right at that confluence where the root's coming out of the pointy end, that's where you'll get your shoot for the acorn. These are, these are live oak acorns. Uh, next slide, please. And this is buckeye, so it's the same kind of germination. Uh, and buckeyes are always kind of interesting because everybody says, well, how do you know which way to plant them? Cause, but if you look at, if you look at a buckeye, they're, they're fairly large seeds. They're probably the, I think they're the largest woody planted seed, uh, woody plant seed in the, in the United States. Uh, if you look at the buckeye on, on the lower end of the, on the lower side of the seed, you'll notice like a, like a, a V shape on the seed. And if you, when you plant the buckeye, you want that V pointing down because that's where the that's where the root's going to come out. Next slide, please. And so there's the buckeye just sprouting out of uh, out of some containers. Next slide, please. So one of my favorite grasses to grow is Festuca californica, uh, California fescue. It has a really diverse uh, range. It grows all the way from the coast. There's a lot of it that grows right on the coast. And then there's a, a lot of it that grows inland. But the interesting thing about Festuca californica is once you get inland, like for instance, in the, in the range of mountains, the Mayakamas between um, Sonoma Valley and Napa, and then also between uh, East of Napa, there's, a, there's another range of mountains called the Mayakamas. Um, once you get away from the coast, the Festuca Californica is almost entirely, uh, 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 it grows, under, it grows under, under the oak trees. So it basically grows in the shade of the oak trees, whereas on the coast it grows out in the full sun. There again, it's a grass, and so it benefits from two weeks of cold. and uh, you get phenomenal germination. In fact, right now I have, I have uh, 600 of them that I don't quite know exactly what to do with. So um, they're in my greenhouse growing and they're doing quite well, but we'll, I'll figure out what to do with them at some point. Next slide, please. So here I am planting, planting grasses. I don't know exactly what I'm planting because I can't read my label, but but um, so basically you fill your flat up with, uh, with some potting soil and then uh, I tamp it down with, with, a, with a board and then I cover the, cover the surface with the seeds that have been stratifying in the refrigerator and then I tamp it down a second time and then I put a covering over it, just a, a light covering. They're grass so you don't need to bury them very deep. General rule of thumb for seeds is you don't want to plant them any any more than three times the size three times the size of the seed deep because otherwise if you bury them too deep they may not come up. Anyway, this is just a process of planting grass seeds. Uh, next, next slide, please. So this is uh, this is uh, Western Columbine. Um, Aquilegia formosa. It's a really nice little plant. Uh, Western, Western columbine actually, it's an easy plant to grow, but it requires a longer stratification, usually 30 days. And, but generally the germination is pretty good. So uh, next slide, please. That's the flower of the Western columbine. And it's actually blooming out in the wild right now. So if you, if you, if you can get out and walk around, I'm not exactly sure if you can, but uh, it, it, it's real, it's a, it's a nice plant and it, and it does well. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the viney honeysuckle. It's actually a fairly fragrant. So if you see this blooming in the wild and stick your nose up in the flower, it's fairly fragrant. And then once the plant gets pollinated by, by insects, then you get these red berries. And there again, it's another plant that requires some stratification. Uh, usually 30 days is, is pretty good. Um, anyway, next slide, please. 
Showy milkweed is another nice plant. Uh, it's also a host plant for the monarch butterfly. Um, I tried to, I, I didn't have any milkweed seed to grow this year. So luckily I actually don't have any for, for this year, but, but um, it has nice flowers. And um, on the upper right is the, actually the larvae for the monarch butterfly that are chomping down on those leaves. So, and, and the, the milkweed is interesting because it's actually a toxic plant. And so the larvae eat the leaves and then they build the toxins up in their, um, in, their, in their bodies and it actually makes them more resistant so they're less prone to get eaten by birds. So, cause the birds eat them and then discover that they probably shouldn't have eaten them. So, um, so cause they build up the toxins in their body but for some reason the caterpillars are fine. They don't, doesn't bother them. And there again, it, it's an easy plant to grow. It doesn't require any stratification. You just plant the seed and it usually comes up. And then, um, anyway, next slide, please. So another one of my favorite plants to grow is, um, is Douglas iris. Um, and so, so Douglas iris, you know, it's it, there again, it grows on the coast and you can actually find it a little bit inland, but mostly it's on the coast. And so, um, uh, but it's a, it's a real nice plant and, and you can grow it two different ways. You can either divide it or you can grow it from seed. I tend to just grow it from seed because it does pretty well from seed. From seed to grow it, you have to, um, uh, you have to, uh, what I do is I, I collect the seed and then I extract the seed from the pods. And then the only thing I do to, to grow it, I don't actually give it any cold. I just soak it overnight in water and then plant it the next day. And I usually get pretty decent germination. And I put a picture of a white flower Douglas iris in there because uh, quite a while ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago, I was hiking on the Pierce Point Trail from Pierce Point Ranch and Point Reyes National Seashore out to the point. And I came across a huge patch of blue Douglas iris and right in the middle, there was one white one. So obviously something's going on and it's hybridizing. And anyway, it's, it's different. So I took a picture of it and I went ahead and put it in. But this is a naturally occurring iris. It isn't one of the, one of the hybrids, which I'll talk about next. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Douglas iris. So the pods are on the lower right. The seed is extracted from the pods up in um, up in the upper upper right. And then you I took a picture to show you what the actual iris seed pod looks like on the on the left. And so what I do is I collect the pods and then um, put them on a tray and dry them out and then extract the seed. Um, I'm not sure if I still have permission, but where I used to get my seed was on a private ranch just down the road. And two years ago, I went up there and collected a bunch of seed and nobody yelled at me. So I'm probably going to do the same thing this year. So we'll see. Uh, next slide, please. There's a close up of the, of the Douglas iris. Next slide, please. And those are the seedlings that are coming up. That's pretty good germination. And there, there again, Douglas iris, it's a bigger seed, so you can bury it a little bit deeper, um, but not a lot deeper, but, uh, but it, it, it actually does pretty well from seed. Next slide, please. So you can also grow iris from division. This is actually a division of some iris that we dug up actually from the site where I collect the seed. And when you want to dug, when you want to um, divide dug iris, you basically want to divide it in the, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, late, late fall is usually the best time to get the, hopefully we've had a little bit of rain. So after the first couple of rains in the fall is a good time to go to divide iris. But there again, I would probably just grow it from seed because um, it's, it's almost easier. But, um, and what you want to look for in iris, and you can see it in this picture, is those white roots, and that's, that's what you're after. Next slide, please. So there's a little 
chunk of dug iris with its white roots. And so you just basically cut that off and you can plant it, um, plant it in a pot and it grows. So next slide, please. So uh, these are hybrid iris and an interesting thing, when, if you ever in a nursery and you see an iris called Canyon Snow, that's the one on the upper left, um, any, any plant with the word canyon in it means that it was originally from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which I believe is at the old Santa Barbara Mission, but I'm not totally sure. And then uh, there's a fellow down in Santa Cruz County named Joe Guillo, who is a world famous iris hybridizer. And he actually goes out with a paintbrush and moves pollen from one plant, one, one blooming iris to another. And um, he had kind of a neat thing where, uh, and we used to do it at the nursery every fall, usually in October, uh, we would send him a check for two or $300 and he would mail back a box of iris and each, in each bundle, I believe there were 10 plants and then each box there was probably 10 bundles. So it was basically a hundred or 200 uh, 10, well, probably maybe 20 bundles, um, but each bundle was a different clone. And like I say, he's a very famous hybrid, hybrid, hybrid iris hybridizer. And um, so he would then grow his seeds out and then he'd, he'd actually want to look at the blooms. And for the blooms that he really liked and thought was worthwhile, he would actually name and he sells those for a lot of money. Uh, his company's called Bayview Gardens, and I believe he's still in existence. And so we would get these unnamed plants from him, and then we'd grow them out. And then so we actually started naming them ourselves. And so the one on the upper right, we call that one butter. The one in the lower left, we call that after midnight. And the one on the right, we call that wine. These are all Joe's um, hybrid iris. So these are basically the ones that don't make the cut that he didn't feel was worthy selling and, and naming and going through the process of actually naming them. So, and I believe if you look him up online, I think he's still around. It's, it's called Bayview Gardens. Uh, next slide, please. So here my grasses are just uh, in their bags waiting to go in the refrigerator. And so what I do is I put them in these bags and then I put the date that they go in and the date that they should come out. And that way I can kind of keep track of when I should plant them. Next slide, please. So grasses, um, this is uh, uh, giant reed grass, Calamagrasis noctensis. It grows right on the coast. There's, there's a ton of it at Shell Beach. If, if anybody ever goes up to the, although I believe all the state park beaches are closed right now, but uh, there's a ton of it that grows right near Shell Beach, and it's, it's probably one of the largest California grasses, native grasses that we have. Um, and I don't have a picture of it, but there is a selection of this grass called, it's called Calamagrasis the King. It's a more compact version. It doesn't get quite as big and it has fatter blades. And it was originally selected by another famous native plant guy named Roger Raish, who uh, found it growing up in the King's Range up in Humboldt County. And then he, he stole some, you know, he, he, he took some samples of it. And I don't know if he grew it from seed or division, if he dug some up, but, or what he did, but he, he named it the King after the King's Range. And uh, like I say, it's a more compact version of, of giant reed grass. So uh, next slide, please. Another Calamagrasis is Calamagrasis foliosa, Mendocino reed grass, and it's a much smaller version. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it, and these are all native bunch grasses. It's a, it's a, it's a much smaller grass, and I believe it's. I don't know if it's rare, but it's not real common. There's not tons of it in the world, but um, it's actually real easy to grow from seed. I can usually produce hundreds of these things from seed. And I just grow the seed in my own garden and then go out in the fall and collect the, collect the seed off the plants and then stratify them for two weeks and then they usually come up pretty good. Okay, next slide, please. And we've 
done that one. That's Festuca Californica. I don't know how that one got in there. Next slide, please. So Madrone's another one. The only problem with Madrone is it's incredibly susceptible to uh, damping off. And damping off is another fungal, uh, fungal plant, fungus that grows right on the surface of the soil and attacks the plant as it germinates. And basically, if a plant gets damping off, there's no way it can survive. So you, you basically, the trick to mitigate for damping off is you want to have the surface of the, keep the surface of the soil as, um, as every, as dry as you can. So you don't want to overwater them. A lot of times if you overwater plants, then they can get damping off. So it gets berries on it and then you can squish up the berries to get the, get the seeds out and then grow the, grow the plants. So next slide, please. Another plant that uh, works, is, is nice to grow, is our native uh, California hazelnut. And I put this picture in because uh, California hazelnut actually has male and female flowers on the same plant. And so um, the upper left is the male catkins that produces the pollen, and the lower right is the female flower, and that's where the seed will form once it's pollinated by the pollen from the catkins. Uh, next slide, please. So that's what the seed looks like in the, for the California hazelnut. Next slide. Uh, Frangula californica, California coffee berry. Um, it's another uh, easy, to, fairly easy to grow native shrub. Uh, you, there are some selections in the trade that have been grown from cutting. One's called Eve Case and one's called Mount San Bruno. Um, I tend to just go out and collect the wild berries and then grow them from seed. Um, and there again, they, they do require some cold, usually 30 days of cold, and, but then they usually come up. So uh, next, please. So here I am uh, processing the, the berries from the Frangula californica. Frang Frangula coffee berry used to be called Ramnus, but about 10 years ago they decided to call it Frangula for some reason. I don't really know why. But um, anyway, so you basically I mash the seeds up and then I put them in a bowl and then I uh, I soak them and then they're they're cut, but they're they're kind of like acorns, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, uh, the, the, the seeds that float are probably not viable, so I usually just get rid of those and I keep the ones that sink to the bottom. So, anyway, next please. And that's what coffee berry looks like when it germinates. Next please. And then that's the flower of the coffee berry. It's actually a very good bee plant. It gets a wide variety of bees, native bee species that will work, work, will work the flowers. And it's, it's a little bit fragrant. So there again, if you stick your nose up in there. Um, anyway. Next slide, please. And another, uh, it's actually turns into a quite a large shrub is uh, Sambucus nigra cerulea, blue elderberry. Um, and it's, it's similar to a lot of the other seeds where you, you mash up the berries to get the, the seeds are tiny. So it's a little bit tricky to get the seeds out of the berries. Um, but what I do is I usually just mash it up and then just plant it all. I plant it pulp and all, and I usually get okay germination on it, so. Um, there again, it's another really good insect plant, and it a, grows along creeks. Um, there's a lot of it along creeks. We have all, also have a, a um, another species that has uh, red flowers, I believe. Uh, next, next slide, please. So there I am mashing up the elderberry, the elderberries. So next, please. Uh, so Morella californica used to be called Myrica. There again, about, I don't know, six or eight years ago, they decided to change its name also. So um, it's a, it's a, it gets quite large. It's a, it's a, 
it's a coastal shrub. It grows along the coast and it, it gets these uh, seeds that have this kind of waxy coating on them. And it has, I don't have a picture of the flower because the flowers are almost too small to photograph, but, but it gets tiny little flowers in the springtime. And then in the fall, it gets, gets covered with these seeds. And so uh, next please. So you collect a seed and then what I do is I put them in a sieve and then, um, you know, get as much of the debris out as I can. And uh, next, next slide, please. And I basically rub it with my hand. You want to put a glove on in this because you, otherwise you'll tear your knuckles up. But, but you want to get that waxy coating off because if you just plant them with the waxy coating on, they won't germinate because the water can't penetrate the seed. In order for a seed to germinate, it, it has to be able to be, be able to penetrate, the water has to penetrate the seed to germinate the embryo and the seed. So you get the wax, the waxy coating off, and then, um, and then you're ready to plant them and, and hopefully they grow. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the seed after the wax is, after the waxy coating is gone. Um, so, and then there again, uh, wax myrtle re does require some, some cold. So I usually, I usually give it 30 days of cold, 30 to 40 days of cold. And then, um, although I planted a bunch of wax myrtle this year, but uh, unfortunately I didn't get much germination. So I don't know what happened, but there is a trick. If you're gonna store the seed and you collect the seed, you want to actually leave the waxy coating on if you're going to store it. And then you only want to take the waxy coating off of the seeds you're actually going to plant that season. So uh, next slide, please. So that's what wax myrtle looks like out in the wild. I believe this photograph is from up in Salt Point State Park. There's tons of it up there. Uh, next slide, please. So another uh, fun native shrub to grow is California uh, Cenothus thirsiflorus, California blue blossom. Um, there's, there's oodles of it out in Point Reyes National Seashore. It grows all over the place out there. And it blooms, it's blooming right now actually in, in, the, in the gardens. And, and then once it blooms and it's pollinated by insects, it gets these uh, kind of hard little seed pods that and so the best time to collect Cenothus seed is usually in late summer, early fall. Um, next slide, please. So here I am, I've collected some seed and now I'm just, and, and an easy way to get the seed out of the, out of the seed pods is there again, is, is the, the cookie sheet in the, in the rolling pin and you basically crack the seed and then you can put the seed in different screens and then screen the seed out so you're not planting all that stuff. Although I think you could probably just plant all that stuff and it would, um, it would work all right, but next slide, please. So in this picture, if you, if you, if you look carefully, you'll see, you'll see the open seed pods and you'll see a bunch of little hard black little seeds. Uh, Ceanothus is an interesting seed because it's one of the seeds that requires two different kinds of treatment to germinate it. Um, it's a hard coated seed and so, so basically it's going to require scarification which means you, you take the seed and you scratch it with sandpaper and the second treatment you give Ceanothus uh, is you put, it in a, you put it in a bowl and you pour almost boiling water on it and then soak it overnight in that water. And for some reason, the combination of the scratching of the surface plus the hot water makes the, makes the seed come up surprisingly well. Um, anyway, so it's, it's one of the plants that requires two different treatments to actually get it to grow. And there's another plant we'll talk about in a minute that requires the same thing. So yeah, next slide, please. So Romnia coulteri, Matea poppy, um, it's another one that's uh, 
it's a little, it's probably one of the more difficult California natives to grow. Um, it has these uh, almost urn like seed pods. And um, this is one where you can, you can, you can soak the seed, you soak the seed in liquid smoke. It's a, it's a basically one of those plants that grows in areas where fires are frequent. And so it's used to ash. And I know when we first had the nursery, we kept trying to grow it. And so we would, we would get some seed and we would put it in a flat and we'd put pine needles on the flat and we'd burn the flat and we just never got any, anything to grow. And then one day uh, there was this, uh, there was this guy who had another nursery up in the Sierra and Foothills and he was in there and he asked if we had any Romney and I said, no, it's, it's impossible to grow. And he said, no, it's easy to grow. And I said, why, how, how's that? And he said, well, you just, you, you soak the seed in liquid smoke and it just comes up. <laughs> and uh, that was, that was pretty neat. So um, it works sometimes. Uh, I think my seed was too old. I tried to grow some for this year's class, but unfortunately none of my seed came up, which is probably okay because I have extra plants now. And anyway, so anyway, it's, it's probably one of our showier California natives. And, and uh, to, uh, next slide, please. So that's what the seed pods look like and they kind of crack open over time. And there again, it's a very fine seed. You can see a little bit on the tray below. I can't remember if the next, the next picture, please. Yeah, so there's the seed. It's those little black specks. That's the, that's the Romnia seed and the Matea poppy, so. Next slide, please. And then there's the little plants, so. This was actually from, from last year's class, but unfortunately my plants weren't big enough, so I, I didn't bring them into the class for last year's class. They weren't quite ready yet, so. Um, but these are actually doing pretty well. So, and there again, it's another plant that I think is susceptible to damping off, kind of like madrone, so you have to be careful not overwatering them. They, they don't like to be overwatered. Next slide, please. So this is a this is a plant in the pea family. The pea families are interesting because they're all they're basically hard coated seeds. This is Lotus formosissimus, coast lotus, and so there again, uh, you you need to you need to sandpaper the seed. Although I, for lotus, I didn't I didn't hot water it. I just sandpapered it, and I actually got pretty good germination. So. And the reason you're sandpapering it is so you put you put tiny little scratches in the seed coat and that allows and then you soak the seed and that allows the seed the water to penetrate the seed and germinate the embryo at the center of the seed. Um, next slide, please. So that's the flower in the coast lotus. Um, it'll be blooming later this spring, hopefully. Next slide, please. So I, I included some plants that I was going to bring that were different from plants I brought last year, but uh, this is Ariagonum, uh, Ariagonum latifolium, the coast buckwheat. And um, there, as you can see, it grows right on the edge of the ocean and it's a, it's, it's a, it has very gray foliage and it has white flowers with a little bit of a pink tinge to them. And um, it's an excellent bee plant. There's tons of, usually tons of bees work it. Uh, next slide, please. And then the bush lupins. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy about yellow bush lupin, whether it's native to our area or not. Uh, the blue ones certainly are, but the uh, lupinus arboreus. And um, we also have another species that grows more inland called lupinus albifrons. And, uh, and there again, it's, it's, it's a pea plant. So there again, you, but this one you do hot water treat. So you scratch the seed with sandpaper and then you cover it with almost boiling water. And usually you get pretty good, pretty good germination. So next slide, please. Big leaf maple is another one that's, uh, and I usually just collect the seed. Um, I don't actually cold treat it. I just mix it with some, some loose potting soil and put it in a, some kind of a bucket and then just put it in a cool dark place and then watch it watch to see when they germinate so they don't get so germinated that you can then 
because if they get too far, they're, they're almost impossible to transplant into pots. Next slide, please. So there they are in their pots coming up. So it's a nice little plant. And actually, surprisingly enough, uh, one of my hobbies is growing bonsai plants. And so uh, it, it bonsai surprisingly well. So I'm, I'm impressed with that. Next slide, please. There's the flower, the big leaf maple. Next slide, please. And then this is uh, our, our, our coastal form of our native poppy. Um, native poppy, native poppy. Scheltzia meridima, uh, Scheltzia californica subspecies meridima. Um, so if you go up onto the, onto the our, our, our north coast and, and walk along, you'll see lots of this blooming. It tends to be a, a smaller plant and it has grayer foliage and it has smaller yellow and it's more compact. So, um, and it has more yellow flowers rather than orange. Uh, next slide, please. So there's the flower and then you can see the plant's quite compact. So, um, and it's, it's, it's easy to grow. You don't need to treat the seed. You can just plant it and it comes up. Next slide, please. And then this was another plant that I was gonna bring in this year, but, um, and there's a, there's a story behind this plant that I'll go through briefly. Um, a couple of years before we closed our nursery, we were approached by uh, the Nature Conservancy and they own a piece of property down in Muir Beach called Spindrift Preserve. And it was given to them by a guy who was a writer who had built a small house on the property and he also built a writing studio overlooking the ocean. And uh, it's a beautiful piece of property. And if you're on the point at his writing studio and you look to your left, you're directly above Muir Beach. And um, so they approached us, uh, they wanted to do some more, they wanted to do some planting and some restoration on the, pro on the, on the uh, property. And so they wanted to know if it'd be possible to hire us to come down and collect seed and then grow plants for them and then they would buy the plants back from us. So we said, sure, we could do that. And so we signed some paperwork and signed some disclosures and that we wouldn't sue them if we were injured walking around on their property and things like that. And then, so this is one of the plants that we collected off their property. It's, but it's not, I thought it was, maybe it was a rare plant, but it's not a rare plant. It's called coast gumweed. And um, anyway, I have a whole bunch of them that I was gonna bring in, but no, I'm not, so. Anyway, so that's, that's how we ended up with this plant. So, and then, like I said, it's not a rare plant, so it probably wouldn't have been illegal to collect it anyway. But we had permission to collect seed and it was a, it was a very successful project for them. We, I forget how many different species we grew for them. I think we grew 20 or 30 different species of plants for them. And they were, they were real happy with the work we did. So uh, next slide, please. So dormant cuttings, uh, I don't really know what these are because I can't read my labels, but um, there's, there's two different kinds of cuttings. You can do, you can do uh, softwood, semi-hardwood, semi and hardwood cuttings. Uh, in my book, hardwood cuttings are almost the easiest because they don't require any much treatment. All you basically do is stick them in a flat and then just put them out in a shady spot and keep them wet and they break dormancy and grow roots and grow leaves. Uh, next, next slide, please. So here's the same, those same groups of plants that are stuck in flats and, um, and they're, they're just, they're just, they're just now germinating. This is in the little, uh, lath house. It's in my backyard where I live. So uh, next slide, please. And then this is an example of a, uh, this is actually not a native, it's a rock rose. I believe it's Cystus cambergi. And so this would be an example of how you treat uh, like a semi-hard, these would be like softwood cuttings. So basically you want to take a cutting where uh, I left I left the two atop just so I could kind of show what I did. So basically, when you take a cutting, you want to leave a little short stub below the 
the two leaves at the very bottom and then a short stub just above the next two leaves. And then you strip the lower leaves off. And then this is where a rooting hormone comes in handy. The most common rooting hormone that people use is one called Hormex, which I believe you can just get. Uh, I know you can get it online, but you can just get that. And so um, you dip, you basically dip the, dip the, 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 the bare end into the rooting hormone and then stick it in a flat with some peat and perlite. And then, but these, these would need uh, mist or, or moisture because once you separate the plant from its parent, it can't get any moisture anymore. So you need to keep it moist so it can survive until it can grow enough roots to start supplying it with water again. Next slide, please. So here, here the plants are in, in a flat that I'm, I'm doing. And um, anyway, so you can get a lot of plants into a flat. You can put them pretty close together and they seem to be fine. Next slide, please. So one trick I, I learned from my buddies that have a, that had a, a, a fairly large propagation business for a long time is that once you take your cuttings, you can um, put, put uh, if you put newspaper over them and then get, keep the newspaper wet, you often have much better survivor. You often, a lot more of your cuttings will root because you're basically holding the moisture and it's almost like a little greenhouse over the, over the rooted cuttings, right around the cutting, so they don't dry out. Next slide, please. So this is what uh, uh, rooted cuttings look like. The one on the plant is uh, C. Noth is Bacris, Bacris pigeon point. Uh, Bacris pigeon point is a low, lower growing, fairly compact, although it, it gets almost four feet tall, so it's not super low growing. Um, and it was selected, I assume, at Pigeon Point Lighthouse down in San Mateo County. And the plant on the right is actually Seaside Daisy, uh, Ridgeron Glaucus. And um, uh, there you can, you can see, so basically, I, anyway, the, you can see how the roots, how the rooted cuttings root. Next slide, please. And another, uh, another uh, succulent type plant that roots actually fairly easily is, this is Sedum spathiofolium Cape Blanco. Um, Cape Blanco is actually in Oregon. So this, pro this isn't really a California native, but it is a selection that's in the nursery trade called Cape Blanco. But we do have Sedum spathiofolium that is native that grows along our own coast here. And so, um, so basically you just take, take little pieces of them. And what I do is I, I, I cut little pieces off and then often I'll let them, I'll let them heal overnight uh, with it before I stick them in the flat so that they kind of harden off just a little bit. And then the next day put them in the flat. And I don't think I use any rooting hormone and I think they just rooted. So next slide, please. So there, there again, these are, these would be, um, this is uh, what's referred to as creek dogwood and, and uh, creek dogwood is interesting because you can do little tiny cuttings like I did here in a flat, or you can go to a, a, a full grown uh, creek dogwood plant and take whole pieces of the plant that are about the size of your little finger and cut them off. And um, if we've had a wet winter, you can actually, if you take two or three of those branches and bundle them together and just jam them into the ground, often they'll just root on their own. Uh, so you don't, uh, there again, it's a hardwood cutting, so you don't, it doesn't require any kind of, um, it, it doesn't require any kind of, uh, you, you don't have to put on mist or anything like that. So uh, anyway, it's, it, it's, a, it's an easy plant. And, and then this is just different pictures of different uh, what I what would refer to as liners. A liner is basically a small plant in a container. And the one on the left is a seaside daisy in what's called a band. And the one in to, just to the right of that is, I don't know what the plant is because I can't tell, but it's growing in what's called a peat pot. And that's another liner type. And then the, the, uh, the next pot over is a little plastic pot. 
as in play. And they're both called rose pots, but they come in different sizes. So the two plastic pots there on the right are both called rose pots, one smaller than the other. And then the plant in the middle that's lying on its side, or again, I'm not sure what it is, but uh, it was actually grown in a plug tray. So it was, it was direct seeded into a plug tray. Um, anyway, so the, these are just different types of small plants. So next slide, please. And then Lilium partilinum is leopard lily. Uh, we produce quite a bit of this in the nursery. And so when you divide out leopard lily, what you're going for is, is the little white scales and, and that's what will grow into the lily. So uh, next slide, please. So there's a, there's a leopard lily that can get replanted and then, but actually if you plant those little scales, those little, those little on the right, those little scales will actually grow into more little leopard lilies. So, and it's a real showy plant. They tend to grow along creeks um, up in the redwoods and places like that. So um, next slide, please. So this is this is interesting because this is soap root. Now, when I was in college and learning about native plants, people always referred to as soap root as a fish poison, because the Native American tribes that used to live in this area, or actually a lot of them still do, um, they would go out and they would dig up the roots of the soap root plant, which is a. I don't think I have a picture of the root, unfortunately, but. It's, it's a fleshy bulb and it's covered with a real fibrous husk. And so they would basically, they would take the husk off and one of the things they used for the husk was they would make brushes out of them. But then they would mash up the, um, the soap root and they would mix it with water. And they call it soap root because when you mash it up, it, um, it, gets, it, it basically gets sudsy. And so they would mash it up and then they found that if you if you drop the soap root like into a tide pool that was full of fish, uh, suddenly the fish would all die and flow to the surface. And so that that's why it was believed to be a fish poison. But then more recently, some people started doing research on it and realized that it, well, it can't be a poison because one of the things that the native tribes use soap root for is they also roasted and ate it. So if it was a poison, you'd think it would hurt them. And it didn't seem to hurt them anyway. And then what it turned out was that instead of poisoning the fish, when you, when you add the, the mashed up soap root to the water, it instantly reacts with the oxygen in the water and basically pulls all the oxygen out of the water. And so the fish actually suffocate. They don't die from poison. They actually can't breathe, so they suffocate. And that's what kills the fish. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And then in the... Uh, we actually grew quite a bit of soap root at the Laguna Foundation, and there it is in uh, in small revegetation cells. And then, um, and then there's some little soap root plants that are in the middle there, and then the flower is on the lower right. So next slide, please. Um, these are just uh, native insects. Um, one of the advantages of using native plants in your garden is you get a, a wide variety of uh, you know, native insects that come in and and work your plants. So there's a bumblebee working a red buckwheat, which is not really native to our area. It's more native to uh, central Cal central and southern California. Um, there's a green sweat bee on a, on a seaside daisy. There's a dragonfly, and then there's a butterfly on some kind of a I'm not sure what that is. Maybe a grandelia looks like probably. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to end up the program here pretty shortly. Um, some of the places that are really interesting to go to, um, I haven't been there that this year, but one of the, my favorite places to go to is, um, is uh, Bear Valley, which is up in Calusa County. And um, the way you get to Bear Valley is you basically, you go, you, you, you take the road over to Napa and then you take, you take Highway 29, you stay on 29 all the way to it, merges with Highway 20. You take 20 east almost to Williams and then at Williams you get to Bear Valley Road 
And Bear Valley Road, it's a gravel road, but it's a good road, so a regular car can actually go on it. My preferred route is I take my four-wheel drive truck and I do the same route, but when I get to the top of a steep grade on 20, right at the top of the hill, there's a road called, called Walker Ridge Road, and it's a really funky road, so I wouldn't recommend people take a regular car on it. Um, it's not very well maintained. It's a forest service road. And it's also where the ranch fire was a couple of years ago up in Lake County, the huge fire they had up there. And so um, I like going up that road and then coming down into Walker Bear Valley and then going get cutting back to 20 on Bear Valley Road. So, um, but the wildflowers are pretty phenomenal. Next slide, please. And then these are just some of the plants you see up in up in Bear Valley. There's a delphinium and then um, a Lewisia is on the lower right. And I can't remember what those other, uh, well, there's gold fields, the yellow, the little yellow flowers are gold fields. And I can't remember what the other ones are right now. But, um, but there's just, there's just really nice. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it is Gilead tricolor, you're right. And so, um, anyway, it's just a nice place to go. Uh, next slide, please. And then another, one of my favorite places to go, although I haven't been down there in many years, is Carrizo Plain National Monument, which is in southeastern San Luis Obispo County. And you get these huge displays of native native wildflowers uh, blooming and um, it's it's pretty phenomenal if you get there and when there's a good bloom this year probably wasn't a very good bloom because we had such a dry winter so um, anyway it's another nice place to go next slide please And then the last place that uh, one of my favorite places to go and there again I haven't been out there yet this year is uh, Chimney Rock out in Point Reyes National Seashore. And you get pretty phenomenal wildflower displays out there also. And that about wraps it up. I think that's the last slide. Does anybody have any questions for Walter? Can you hear me? Yeah. I was asking, I'm sorry. I was asking about stratification. And there were some other questions about stratification, like how long to stratify seeds and um, exactly what is it? And are there different ways of stratifying? Um, generally, stratification is either, either warm or cold. And um, so, and, and there's a fair amount of information out there about, about how to treat seed. Um, maybe I can show it. Let me, let me get something. I don't know if you can see this, but this is probably one of my favorite books for um, how to treat seeds. Can you show the book again? Seed propagation. Maybe it's backwards. Is it backwards? No. Propagation. Anyway, it's a book. It's called uh, Seed Propagation in California Native Plants by Dara Emery. Uh, Dara Emery was the, ran the uh, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden for many, many years. And um, so he, He's a real expert on these things. So and I believe it's still in print. I, I had a question about um, hardwood cuttings. Does it matter mm -hmm. the age of the wood that you're cutting? Like, should you take the fresh last year's growth for the cutting or? Probably, it... yeah. Yeah, because there, like I said, there's a couple different kinds of cuttings. When they were, some, some books refer to semi-hardwood cuttings and usually a semi-hardwood cutting is basically a cutting from the that spring's growth. So, and there's something called, what's it called, the snap stage. So sometimes if you, if you take a, 
if you take a cutting and then um, it snaps, and that's ideal time to, to try to stick it. And hardwood cuttings are just, you basically just take the cuttings when there's no leaves on the plants after they've gone dormant for the winter. Thank you. And like I say, they're super easy. They just, they just grow and root, and yeah. So, so uh, what's the possibility of rooting in, in uh, water as opposed to potting soil? Um, I never did much rooting in water. I always was worried that I'd get some kind of infection, some kind of dis, you know, stagnation in the water or something like that. I, I've noticed that when I take, just anecdotally, when I take cuttings and put them in water and then try to transplant them into soil, they tend to die. Um, so yeah. I don't know if, it, if the plant becomes acclimated to the water environment yeah. and can't handle yeah. the soil or what, but. I, I mean, I mean, cuttings, you know, they, they do require, you know, some kind of little greenhouse or something like that. But like I say, you know, I've always done dormant cuttings just outside in a, under shade, and that seems to work pretty well. Just, just in potting soil, and, and the, uh, the, the uh, hormone, Hormex, that, that's obviously important. Um, it helps, yeah. Yeah, although you don't, you don't necessarily need to do that for dormant cuttings. Dormant cuttings don't necessarily benefit from that, in my experience. Okay, thank you, thank you. Other people had questions on chat. Do you yeah. want to read them or do you want to just ask your own questions? Um, you just read them, I think. I think one question that some folks had was, um, do you have any recommended sources for native seeds that you really like? Um, I actually collect most of my own seed. So, um, I, mean, I mean, there are some, you know, collecting native seed, and there again, it's, it, it's a little tricky. Collecting native seeds is always a little tricky because technically if you're in a park or something, you're not supposed to collect it. So. But, you know, I still do a little bit, so. We have a question from Olivia. What time of year can you collect the iris seeds? Um, iris is best collected in, well, it's blooming right now. So it won't be setting seed probably for another few weeks. So probably June, July, something like that. From Glenda, what is a good soil blend and pH for growing native seeds? Um, I usually just use a potting soil that drains pretty well. So, um, and lately I've been using, um, uh, been growing a fair amount of stuff just in black gold and it seems to work fine. Okay. How do you use coffee grounds to propagate elderberry? Um, cause supposedly it, it benefits from just a little bit of, um, acid treatment. So acid, acid treatment is probably another type of scarification where it probably helps break down the seed coat and so the water can penetrate the seed to germinate. Okay. From Linda, how does the waxy coating get removed in its natural environment? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think the way it gets removed is the seeds get eaten by birds and then they go through the bird and end up on the ground coming out the other end of the bird. I think that's probably how they, how that happens, yeah. Congratulations, Julie, on that answer. Um, how do you determine how long to stratify different seeds? Well, there again, if you often, and I've had pretty good luck doing this, if you just put the, put the seed name in your web browser, often you, you can find information about, about it and, uh, Anyway. Okay. Um, is Creek Dogwood, oh, Glenda wrote that Creek Dogwood is used in basket making? It was, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Walter. We really, really appreciate. Okay, well, well thanks for taking over my screen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't make it work. <laughs> Thank you, Walter. No problem. You're welcome. It was wonderful. 
So hopefully we'll be able to get together next year. Yes, definitely. <laughs> so, we lots and I'll, of fun with you and I'll grow all the plants all over again, so don't worry about that. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay.